know I'm forgiven. The future sure, the price that has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin's been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but it's Christ in me. Praise God. Take your Bibles and join me in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And as we read together or look at together the Word of God, let's rejoice in an empty tomb. Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, We are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Father God, as we gather this morning in celebration of a living, a resurrected Savior, we give praise first and foremost to you being a God that has loved sinners to the extent that you would see your own son crucified on a cross, humiliated by men, and defiled with our sin, that you might provide redemption so free and so full. We thank you as well for a son that is so willing, so holy, so perfect, and of such great power and majesty that he not only bore our sins on a cross and surrendered his spirit to death, but he rose three days later and walked out of the grave. And today he is seated at your right hand. Father, we give praise to you for your spirit as well. The God that regenerates, the God that breathes new life, the God that gives the gift of faith by your grace. Thank you, Father, for being a God that loves sinners. Because we gather here this morning as sinners who have been loved, redeemed, and given hope. Let our hope, let our redemption fuel our passion to worship you this morning and as we leave this place to continue living in worship for you because we have been raised with your son. We pray this in his honor and for his glory. Amen. As Christian was reading the scripture this morning and you listen to the account of the resurrection again, it is still stunning, is it not, to read that after the tomb was vacated, Men objected to even a resurrected Christ to the extent that they would conspire against him and money would be exchanged to silence this story. 
I think in our nation there used to be a time at least when the idea of the resurrection was respected if it wasn't believed. It was at least respected. It is no more, is it? You're either despised because of the rejection or the resurrection that you believe or your hope is found there. This week I was reading a news story and I was a bit overtaken by this particular news story because a a political figure and apparently a medical doctor was celebrating the coming resurrection celebration that we enjoy and apparently he was a believer, is a believer because he wrote this article and it was posted on the news as that which gives hope to mankind, the empty tomb. And if you've ever taken the time to scroll down at the bottom of those articles, sometimes you read the comments below. And after this man had given testimony of his love and his hope in the resurrection, the empty tomb, and a living Savior, this is the comment that one person wrote. He said, if we really want to improve democracy... We should stop people who are stupid enough to believe these convoluted stories from voting. (laughs) There's a point where someone is too stupid to be able to make good decisions. And that point is when they believe in this nonsense. I don't think this is an isolated attitude toward Christianity or the resurrection any longer. In this nation, we are viewed as so ignorant, apparently we shouldn't even be able to vote. Because we believe in the empty tomb. Our Resurrection Sunday celebration is truly a traditional part of church history. And for a good reason, our entire Christian faith, our entire belief system rests upon the empty tomb. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. And by the empty tomb, we mean that Jesus Christ is alive. He rose again in three days. And he ministered for some 40 days thereafter, and then he ascended to the Father, to the throne in heaven where he is to this day. And if this were not true, then as Paul says, our faith is in vain, we're false witnesses of God, we're still in our sins, and we're even to be most pitied among all of humanity. And I think we understand that Easter has many pagan devices that is attached to it. And certainly as we look at God's word, this day in particular, recognizing the resurrection, is not a holy day in that it has not been ordained by God. If it was ordained by God, it would be instructed in his word that we remember one day for the resurrection. But the very fact that the church has gathered since its earliest days on the first day of the week is a resurrection celebration in itself, isn't it? A famous British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once preached on an Easter Sunday with these words. We gather together on the first rather than upon the seventh day of the week because redemption is even a greater work than creation and more worthy of commemoration and because the rest which followed creation is far outdone by that which ensues upon the completion of redemption. There's nothing like the rest of redemption. That's what Spurgeon is saying. The rest that we have in Christ. Our first day of the week gathering every week is the result of the early church meeting on that day in commemoration of the resurrection of Christ which ushered in a new Sabbath rest for the people of God of far greater significance than even the Sabbath rest of creation, as Spurgeon Spurgeon admits. A -a once-a-year Easter holiday may not have been ordained by God, but the weekly holiday of Sunday worship most, most certainly has been ordained by God in recognition of God's Son and His victorious redemption. And this means that you and I continually or corporately celebrate the empty tomb as we faithfully gather each week in the name of Jesus Christ. Resurrection Sunday, then, is every Sunday. And in the same way, the believer's resurrection, the believer's resurrection is a continual celebration. And this is so because believers have been united with the resurrected Christ by faith. The Apostle Paul put it this way, Galatians 2.20, 
You will want to kids know this. Many of us adults know this verse. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live by faith in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That is Paul's testimony that wasn't just a memory verse for Paul. It wasn't just an exciting declaration that we speak to each other. This was his living testimony. And this is the theme for our study this morning. I mentioned on the way over here driving with my family that I wasn't going to have a necessarily traditional Easter Sunday message. You know, my wife said, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I hope it is not an uh uh-oh. But I hope that we look at the resurrection of Christ with a sense that we have been raised with him. And what does that mean to us today? In celebrating Easter or Resurrection Sunday, not one day a year, but every single week. And in truth, every single day, what does that mean to us? What does the resurrected Christ mean to us? in a practical day-to-day sense. I want you to turn to our text this morning, Colossians chapter 3. This will be our our place of study this morning. And it's the very first line in verse 1 of chapter 3 that will capture our attention right away as it speaks of the resurrection. The resurrection. I'm going to read beginning verse 1 down to verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Colossae, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ... Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is received, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Our study this morning is going to focus on the resurrection realities that Paul names in the first four verses. But clearly, he continues on into the rest of this letter, instructing every Christian on what it means to live in the living Christ, to live in the living Christ. And in this portion of his letter to the Colossian believers, Paul is endeavoring to exhort them how to live because of who Christ is, and in particular, who Christ is to his chosen people. Verses 5 to 11, being raised up with Christ will mean the believers must put off the old ways of sin, the old way of living before we came to faith in Christ. In verses 12 to 17, calling us to put on the new way of living. 
And this is what we just read in verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And the reason that believers are to do so is because this is the character of the Savior who believers are now joined with or joined to. Believers are to forgive just as Christ has forgiven. We're to love because we have been loved. We're to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. It's living the character of the Savior. His word is to richly dwell within us. Being raised up with Christ means living Christ. We tend to look at the resurrection from the view of what Christ has given to us. And he's given us much, hasn't he? But Paul wants the church to know, because of the cross, this is how we are changed. This is how we're to be different. We observe the words that Paul penned at the opening of this portion of the letter. Verse 1, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ. This is a reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that all true believers are united with him by faith. And that little word, if, in that statement may give to us the wrong understanding of what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote these words. He was not meaning to suggest here that professing Christians may not be true believers, even though that may be true. Nor is he questioning that Christians may or may not be raised up with Christ. Because that is certainly not true. Every true believer is raised up with Christ. So the little word if may throw us off a bit. And the translation may better sound like this or may better read like this. Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ. The meaning here is that true believers are most certainly raised up in union with Christ, and this is the repeated declaration throughout the New Testament. If you are here in faith this morning, you have been raised up with the resurrected and living Christ. And therefore, Paul is saying, this then is how resurrected people live. Resurrected believers look different, they think different, they speak different. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're very familiar with what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. That before faith, we were dead to God in our trespasses and sin. We are under this fallen world, the domain of this world. We are under the God of this world, Satan himself. But verse 4, but God being rich in what? Mercy. With the love with which he loved us, by grace we have been saved, he did what? He raised us up together with Christ and seated us in the heavenly places. We're going to observe in our text this morning the heavenly places that we've been raised up to dwell in. But what we hope to give attention to in this study is that since we are joined with the resurrected Christ, we are to live as those who have been raised up with him. So look with me at our text this morning, beginning with verses 1 and 2, and what I see here is the continual pursuit of Christ. The continual pursuit of Christ. Paul sets before us, I want you to notice, two imperatives. And we know what imperatives are, right? They're commandments. And therefore, it is good that we have been given a picture in verse 1 of the ascended Christ. He is no longer hanging out here in this world, is he? Where is he? He is seated on the throne at the right hand of God the Father. And therefore, two commands have been given to Christ's resurrected people. And both of these imperatives require the believer to establish a new life with Jesus Christ in full view. In other words, the resurrected Christ must be our priority. The first of the imperatives, seek the things of Christ. And the way that Paul puts it, he says, keep pursuing. Keep going after the things of Christ. Within this command, it is written in the present tense, which means you do it now and you keep on doing it. Or to seek after the things 
that are above where Christ is seated. In other words, go after with passion the things that belong to Christ. The things that are above in this reference is speaking about all of those things that Christ has given us to do. All of those things that have been given to us to live by. And it must include our service and our ministry given to the church from Christ. It must include his instruction on righteous living, on loving, on forgiving. It must include putting on the heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. It must also be the biblical instruction on wholesome communication. These are all things that Paul has written here in chapter 3. Living as a resurrected believer must emphasize a daily devotion to growing in Christ-likeness, our sanctification. We are to keep pursuing, keep after, keep seeking a life of community and continual fellowship with the body of Christ, his church, just as Christ in his word is directed. To keep seeking the things of Christ means that we're living for the passions and the purposes of the one who sits enthroned. In other words, Jesus Christ must be directing our activities. For this to be fulfilled by any one of us means that we must get out of the way. The old self has to be done away with. And Christ must take over. He must be the priority. And that's why Paul wrote, it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And we observe from Galatians 2.20, as Paul spoke those words, that he goes on to say, the life which I now live in the flesh. In other words, he's talking presently. He's not talking future tense. One day when I get to heaven, then I'll behave. Then I'll think more about the things of God. No, Paul is saying it is no longer I who live now. Christ lives in me. And so it must be with each one of us. We're to be continually pursuing the things that belong to the king, the one who sits enthroned. Now, this does not mean that we're not to pursue a career or education or that we're not to give any attention to caring for our properties or our finances. It doesn't mean we ignore what it takes to live in this world. What it does mean is that all things now, all things, are to be governed by Christ and done according to his purposes and for his pleasure. Look again at verse 17. That's exactly what Paul said, isn't it? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. All. Word or deed. Seeking the things above is descriptive of the activities and the functions of life, that the things we do are now marked by Christ-directed living. And Paul emphasizes that this must be the continual and ongoing pattern of life for us. This is living in unity, friends, with the resurrected Christ. This is what the resurrection means to us. Christian living should never be something we do just on Sunday morning or on a special occasion like Christmas or Easter. This is the ongoing pattern of those who are truly Christian. It's now about Christ who lives in us. Second imperative, verse 2. Not only going after the things of Christ, but notice the mind is to be set on the things above, the things that belong to Christ. Set your minds on things above, not on the things that are on earth. This means that Jesus Christ must have full possession of our thoughts, our motives, our passions, our purposes. And again, Paul uses the present tense, which means we do it now and we keep on doing it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul says that the believer now has the mind of Christ. But that doesn't mean that the Christian automatically begins to have all the right thoughts to do all the right things, to have all the right passions and affections. True believers have the mind of Christ when it comes to the gospel, to sin, to salvation, justification by faith. We have the mind of Christ in regard to his humanity, his deity, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his eternal kingdom in heaven. But with regard to knowing all things, 
that are being known of Christ, this too is a growing process for the believer. Just as we are to sanctify and grow in our pattern of living for Christ, so are we to grow in sanctification of our thought life, our thinking for Christ. One author writing on this text said, you must not only seek heaven, you must also think heaven. You must not only seek heaven, you must think heaven. And this is exactly what was written to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. What does renewing of your mind do? Paul said, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, we renew our mind continually so that we learn what God's will is, so that we can live that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You see, the mind and the seeking of things must go together. That's why those two imperatives are so important to resurrection living. The renewing of our minds is an ongoing process of growth and maturity in Christ, and it is through this growth that we progressively learn and we validate in our practice what the will of God is, So we do what is good, acceptable, and perfect, and walk in the will of the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, we read a similar thought. Whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good report, things that are excellent, worthy of praise, think on those things. Put your mind into those things. And we don't learn that stuff from the newspaper, do we? Or turning on the news on television, or reading a magazine, or talking to our neighbor. We learn those things from Christ himself. How do we know what is true and honorable, right and pure and lovely? We go to the word of Christ. He tells us how to think. We're not to set our minds on fleshly things, Paul said. The deeds of darkness that the world might enjoy. But we are also not to set our minds in a lustful way upon the things of this world that cannot last. That which is temporal in this world is not part of the heavenly realm or the things above where Christ is. The evil things of this world are forbidden for us, to be sure. But the good things of this world are not forbidden, are they? Yet if those good things become the priority of our lives, or they become idols of the heart, we have set our minds on the wrong things. Having the mind of Christ means that our thoughts are guided by his word. His priority is my priority, his passions. That's where I set my affections, his purposes. That's what I pursue in life. How important both of those directives are for us that are living in Christ, the resurrected Christ. Because if we've been truly raised up with Christ, then our sanctified actions alone will never do. Even the world can gussy up their behavior. They can polish up the outside of the cup. And too many Christians are very good at that as well. I I suppose all of us are guilty of that. We like to, to dress up the outward behavior. But it's the heart, it's the mind that needs to drive that behavior. Our passions. Where our passions are, you know your hands, your feet, your lips, they'll follow. So Paul has given us two directives, two imperatives in regard to resurrection living. Go after the things of Christ and put your mind on the things of Christ. This brings us to a second important reality when it comes to resurrection living. It's our hidden position with Christ. We see that in verse 1 and again in verse 3. In other words, the reason the believers are to go after the things of Christ The reason that we are to set our minds on the things of Christ, we see it right in verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's why we go after the things of God. That's why we set our minds on the things of Christ. Jesus Christ died on a cross to forever deal with our unrighteousness. And he rose again on the third day so that we might experience newness of life in him. And this brings us to our next consideration here, resurrection living. 
and what I feel is the primary truth that we are dealing with this morning. The believer has died to the old self, even as Christ died bearing our sins, and we have been raised up with Christ in God. And you have to love the way that Paul words that here. We are hidden with Christ in God. Why are we to keep seeking things above? Why set your minds on things above? Because that's where the enthroned Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. And believers have been raised up with the enthroned Christ. And this means my life now belongs to him. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 6. We are no longer our own, are we? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Why are we to think and pursue things above? It's because our king has commanded it. The pinnacle of the resurrection is the coronation of Christ as the king. When he rose out of the tomb, he didn't go seek a career. He didn't get an education. He didn't start a business. He ascended to his throne in heaven. And if it were not for that, what kind of a Christ, what kind of a Savior would, be, would we be worshiping today? This Savior walked out of the tomb having been dead, and then he rose to heaven, ascending to his throne where he rules to this day. We now belong to him. You know, as Christian Americans, we can tend to be a very conservative people when it comes to politics. I think most of us highly value our system of government as a constitutional republic. We believe strongly in freedom and liberty. And when those liberties are ignored or subverted, especially by politicians, we can be known to raise up that yellow flag with a snake on it and say, don't you dare tread on me. We have liberties, we have freedoms, and yet the moment we surrendered by faith to Jesus Christ, he became our master. And what did we become? His slave. You see, we are part of an eternal monarchy, a theocracy. There's no heavenly constitutional republic here. We do not vote on our heavenly representatives we don't question the laws that our king has put into place. There's no appeals in his courtroom. Jesus and Jesus alone is king, and his word stands fast. And if you think about it in truth, no appeal or vote of the people is necessary because his reign is according to his perfect righteousness, his perfect justice, his perfect compassion. He alone knows what is good and right for every one of his people, so he doesn't need to be questioned. There doesn't need to be a vote. There is no need for an appeal. Paul writes that because of the resurrection of Christ and that we've been raised up with him in faith, we are now commanded to seek his things and to set our mind on his things. Christ is on the throne. He's ruling at the right hand of the Father, and we are now his subjects, devoted to do his will. Why are we to do this? Because we've died. The old man has died. And our life is now hidden with Christ in God. Death has occurred. New life has begun. And according to Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, union with Christ means union with his death and his resurrection. That's what it means to be united with Christ. Paul writes, Romans 6, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Those two realities are what we need to think about for just a moment. We've died with Christ, and we've been raised with Christ. Verse 3, the beginning part of verse 3 of Colossians 3, believers have died. For you have died. First, for God's word to tell us that we have died with Christ means that in a spiritual sense, we were joined with him while he hung on a cross and our sins were placed upon him and God judged his son on account of our sins. 
he made payment for our sins. And when we became his by faith, we declared these spiritual realities in connection with the old man of sin dying. Number one, Romans 8, verse 1, we are no longer under condemnation. We've died to sin. We're no longer under condemnation. Why? Because Christ paid the price for our sins. Colossians 2, every charge against us was nailed to the cross. And by his poured out blood, he paid for every single one of them. And therefore, believers will never face God's judgment against our sin since his son received the full judgment. Romans 6, verse 17, verse 20. Not only is there no condemnation, we are no longer a slave to sin. We are no longer a slave to sin. This is what it means to die with Christ. We're not a slave to sin any longer. And this means even though we may choose to sin, and too often we do, we no longer are compelled to submit to sin as the master over us. Christ has set us free from that former bondage to sin. And furthermore, John 17, 16, we are no longer of this world. We once were. We are no longer of this world. Jesus, in praying to the Father before his disciples, taught them, you're not of this world. You used to be, but you're not any longer. You look at Colossians 2.20. As Paul began to articulate All wisdom and knowledge is in Christ. We don't go with the world's philosophies anymore. We don't follow their traditions. Chapter 2, verse 20, we don't even follow their religious distinctions. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why as if you are living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? The decrees set by the world. Why do we live according to the determinations of the world when we're dead to the world? We don't belong to that world anymore. If we don't belong to this world any longer, we are no longer under the dominion of Satan, who is called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4. There's much more that could be said about what it is to us to die with Christ. But what this means for us is that we can no longer continue to live as we once did since Christ died for us. The follower of Christ is therefore dead to the old life of sin the old self-centered way of living, dead to the way the world lives. The second part of this, not only have we died with Christ, but verse 3 again, Colossians 3, we've been raised up with Christ. We've been made alive with Christ. For if you have died, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's a fascinating description of being made alive with Christ, hidden with Christ in God. Now, there are two possible ways for us to understand Paul's meaning here when he speaks of us hidden with Christ in God. First, the word hidden has the meaning of being kept secret or concealed by covering. And what this suggests is that once we come to faith, we have been covered over by Christ himself, covered with Christ. And therefore, as God sees us, he doesn't see us as the man or the woman of sin any longer. He sees us as his son. Even though we are no longer a slave to sin, even though there's no condemnation against us for sin, we still sin, don't we? It is amazing to me that God now looks at us and he doesn't see that sin. But the reality is the blood of Christ is covered. The righteousness of Christ is covered. That's what we read in 2 Corinthians 5. We have become the righteousness of God in Christ. Think of yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ. Well, you know that didn't come by your doing. That is the Son of God that is covering you. You're concealed. You're hidden with Christ in God. But there's another connotation that I believe is also true to Paul's choice of words here, to be hidden with Christ in God can mean to hide in a safe place. You're hidden in a safe place. And what this teaches us is that we're fully 
secure in Christ and in God's embrace. Boy, that makes me think of John 10. Nobody can snatch you out of the hand of the Savior, right? Because he's greater than all. And my Father, who is more powerful than all, has a hold of you as well. Nobody can take you out of his hand. You are hidden with Christ in God. That's a safe place. Why does the world mock the empty tomb? To be raised to a life hidden with Christ, therefore, has these spiritual realities. Romans 8, verse 9. We have his spirit within us. That's what it means to be hidden with Christ in God. We have his spirit within us. Within us. Romans 8, verse 9 teaches that the true believer has the Spirit of God dwelling within, and if any do not have the Spirit, they don't belong to Christ. Well, how do we know if we belong to Christ? How do we know if we have the Spirit? Paul, Paul goes on to write, Romans 8, that those who are led by the Spirit, those are the true children of God. In other words, those who are seeking the things above, those who are setting their minds on the things of Christ. They have the spirit of Christ. They're being led by Christ. Second, Romans chapter 6, verse 18, verse 20. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are a slave to what? His righteousness. The righteousness of God. We've been made slaves to God himself. We're enslaved to God. He is our new master. We're enslaved to do his righteousness or to live by his will. And third, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, it tells us we are citizens no longer of this world. We are citizens of his eternal kingdom. Citizens of his eternal kingdom. We're no longer alienated from God. But having been raised up with Christ, we have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. We are fellow citizens with the saints of God. We're of his household being built up together into a dwelling place of God. If you look back at Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul opens this letter with these words, For he, God, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. We are now part of that kingdom. And this means that we're now under the eternal reign of Christ who is the king of that kingdom, who is seated at the right hand of God. He is our eternal king, and we are subject to his word, slaves to his will. Why must we seek the things of God? Why must we set our minds on the things of Christ, heavenly things? Because the risen Christ is also the reigning king, and we belong to him. And this brings us to a third consideration from these first four verses of Colossians 3, focusing on the fourth verse. Our final point of study this Resurrection Sunday is the forever paradise the the believer has with Christ. Ephesians 2 speaks of a heavenly place that we now have with Christ. God, by his mercy, has made us one with Christ and seated us with him, with Christ, in the heavenly places. And we see from Colossians 3, verse 4 here that there is both a present and a future application to that position that we need to consider. One author writes, these verses reflect Paul's conviction that the life and the destiny of the believer are inextricably bound up with Christ. Both the present life and the future destiny of the believer are inextricably bound up with Christ. And this is perhaps where I think many of us may go very wrong in living our relationship with Christ. It's correctly assumed that we're going to spend eternity with him. It's also correctly assumed that his spirit indwells us, so Jesus has never parted from his people. He is always with us. Yet generally, we will live every day with a thought that, well, I'll call on Jesus when I need him. When I need the extra help, he'll come, he'll take care of it. Perhaps I'll spend a small amount of my day in private devotions, offer an occasional prayer. I'll give thought to the things of Christ when my mind happens to focus on those things. Sunday morning, that'll be a time I give full attention to Jesus, at least for an hour and a half, as long as I don't want to sleep in. 
or I don't have something more entertaining or more financially profitable to do. I come, I'll sit and listen, unless my mind is distracted by more satisfying temporal things of this life, I generally leave the church activity to those people that are paid to do it, or maybe more qualified than I am, or so I will tell myself. Paul addresses that kind of nominal Christian perspective here in verse 4. When Christ, note the next word, who is my life. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. This is where my part of the sermon gets a little bit edgy. Here he makes certain that we understand that our eternity will be bound up in Christ as it is in this present life. It is the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection with him that has caused this. So consider these two parts with me. First, the present glory in verse 4. Christ, who is our life. When Christ, who is our life. We consider the present glory that we share with the living Christ. Paul clearly wants us to consider our future days with Jesus Christ in this verse. But it's almost like he pauses here, mid-sentence, mid-thought, and injects the truth of our identity with Christ. When Christ comes, he stops right there. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed. And this is a major theme throughout the letter to the Colossians. It's about being in Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Chapter 1, verse 27. That's the repeated theme throughout Colossians. Christ in you, you in Christ. It is probably more likely that when we think of being glorified with Christ, where does our mind go? Heaven, right? That's when I'm going to be glorified with Christ. Eternal life, when I go to heaven, when I die, I leave this place behind. We think, how wonderful will that day be for us? But before our minds are allowed to even think of that future glory, Paul reminds us that Christ is now our life. It's all too easy for Christians to live in present distractions. And we all get caught up in it. The busyness of life takes hold of our thoughts and our duties. The problems of this life keep us away from seeking the things above. Could even be a pandemic that is, that's inspiring a fearful retreat. Perhaps it's prosperity or pleasure or just plain selfish living. Maybe this life has not panned out the way you think God should have provided for us. Living in something of a disappointment. So we retire to a comfortable place of licking our wounds and living in the shadows. All the while, we have our eyes set on eternity and we content ourselves to say, Ah, heaven's going to be so much better. I hope it comes soon. Because I'm not finding much satisfaction here. That kind of spiritual lethargy. Paul would say, brother or sister, Christ is now your life. You've been raised up with the resurrected Son of God. And you are to keep seeking His things. Keep your mind fixed on what He has for you. You are to live in His present glory. There is a glory to be revealed, to be sure. But there is a present glory in that we have been raised up with Christ and we have been entrusted with his things, heavenly things. I'm very often reminded of Paul's words in Philippians chapter 1. We love these words, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. We love that last part, to die is gain. Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Look at the mess of our nation. The world, our community around us. But we miss or gloss over that first part. part for to me, to live is Christ. And remember, Paul grappled with that idea. Heaven is so much better. It's the far better thing. But Paul says, stay here or go to heaven. I don't know which to choose. Stay in this world that tortures me and persecutes me, that's filled with Christians and churches that are nothing but trouble, or heaven and its glory. And Paul says, I don't know which to choose. What's wrong with him? 
What was wrong with Paul is he saw the glory of living in Christ in the here and now. He said, Jesus leaves me here. I continue ministering to the progress of the joy of your faith, he writes to Philippians. Those believers could grow in Christ if Paul would just handle the glorious things of Christ. If he would seek the things above. If he would set his mind on the things of Jesus who sits enthroned. I'll serve you now. The present glory of being in Christ meant so much to the Apostle Paul. Perhaps too often we're looking for the joy of life that we want, not the joy of our gospel faith with Jesus Christ. And I think I'm as much at fault as any of you. We need to see our present time here on earth as a life that is Christ. We need to see the present glory of being raised up with him where we're continually in pursuit of heavenly things, setting our minds to his glories, his purposes. If with Paul, you could say right now, Christ is my life, what might that change in your present state? If you could honestly say with the Apostle Paul, today, Christ is my life, what would that change? And we move to the second part, the future glory. Verse 4 that will be revealed with Christ. We have so much to look forward to. Verse 4 continues by encouraging the Christian to live presently, knowing that the day is going to come, we're going to see all the troubles in this life are worthwhile. The future glory is going to be revealed. It's the glory of our completed salvation, when in the presence of the Savior, we are forever freed from sin, pain, and sorrow. We'll see him face to face. And the scripture says we will be like him, just as he is. The word of God tells us that we are to always have our eyes fixed on that day. We're told to long for it, to desire that day. In other words, we're to keep seeking the things above because we're looking above. We're to keep pursuing a mind that is fixed on the things of Christ because we're thinking about him. We're anticipating that day to come. We're living presently, anxious to see the risen Christ. I want to turn your attention as we close this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's in this passage that we see these two thoughts brought together so wonderfully. Future glory, present glory. Paul was looking forward to that future glory. And he writes in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, In the future... There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also all those who loved his appearing. Most of you here today that are true believers, do you not love his appearing? You're anxious to see him. We're anxious to be done with all of this pain and trouble. Paul was excited as he wrote those words. And he wrote them as he was facing his own execution. He was about to be condemned to die and beheaded. And it's very important that, he was look, that we see that he was looking forward, very apparent to us, that he was excited about the prize that Jesus had promised to give him. It's a crown representing the righteousness of Christ's glory. Paul said he's going to get that crown. Because he loved the appearing of Jesus. And the same would be true of all believers that love the appearing of the Lord. But what we don't want to miss here is why Paul was excited about this crown. Why did he anticipate getting this crown? He was not just a Christian who sat quietly in the shadows of Christian service and ministry. Rather, before he told Timothy that Christ has laid up in heaven this reward, back up one verse with me. Paul wrote, I have fought the good fight, I finished the course, I kept the faith, and I'm anticipating that crown of righteousness. We can't leave those two parts or verses separate. How do we know that Paul was truly excited about the future glory with Christ? Because he was living in the present glory of Christ. How do we know that he was devoted 
How do we know that he was in love with that future heavenly picture, promise? Because he lived in the present in that promise. It's one thing to say, I'm really looking forward to glory in heaven when we have little thought of the glory in Christ here in the present. I'm really looking forward to what is yet to come when we're ignoring the glory of living this present life in Christ, in his present glory. And therefore, the mention of both our present glory with Christ and our future revelation with him glory is meant to encourage the believer that as we move closer to that day of perfection and eternal fellowship with Christ, our time here on earth is preparing us for that day. Our time here on earth expresses our passion for that coming day of glory. It's awful hard for us to say, I'm really looking forward to heaven when you're not living that way here on earth. If we have little interest in the righteous things of Christ in this life, are we really truly anxious to see that righteous crown placed on our head in heaven? It is our pursuit of the things above in this life that prepares us for the next. Our love for the coming glory of Christ will be evident in our love for his present glory. Now, in closing, if spiritual lethargy were not a problem in the church, Paul would not have needed to write these words. If spiritual discouragement were not a problem in the church, he wouldn't have written them. If spiritual selfishness or indifference or ignorance or spiritual defection was not a problem with Christians, why make an exhortation like this? The truth is, all of us struggle with these things to some degree. Therefore, it is necessary that the Word of God reminds us Christ is our life because He lives, that we have been raised up with the resurrected Christ, that one day we're going to be revealed with Him in glory, and that this risen Savior is the enthroned King of kings, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus Christ lives, and we live in Him. And for this reason, just three quick considerations. Number one, consider if you have actually been raised up with Christ. Consider if you have been raised up with Christ. If some measure of seeking things above or setting the mind on things of Christ is not part of your life, you may need to consider, have you surrendered your life by faith to Christ? And we'd, we would challenge you this morning. What a wonderful day to do that. On the day that remembers or memorializes the resurrected Christ. I encourage you, if you haven't done so, give your life to Christ, the resurrected one who is seated on the throne of heaven. Second, consider what it means to your life that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What does it mean to you that Christ is seated at the right hand of God? As a professing follower of Christ, do you live as one surrendered to his rule? Is he your Lord and Master? Do you submit daily to his will? As we've been instructed, are you pursuing the things above, setting your mind on the things that belong to Jesus Christ, in the present, pursuing his glory? And third, consider how you may value the coming revelation of Christ's glory. How do you value the coming revelation of Christ's glory? If we are truly looking forward to the future glory with Christ, you will be equally concerned for his present glory as we live in him. God, help us to live that way before this world. Father in heaven, we gather as believers that have been made alive by your son, Jesus Christ, and his finished work on Calvary. Our sins have been forgiven. There's no condemnation against us any longer. The old man of sin is laid to rest, no longer a slave to that form of living. But now we've been made a kingdom people, slaves to your righteousness, with a future glory awaiting us. Father, would you help us as a church people to live as resurrected believers, to live in the present glory of our Savior, 
to enjoy and relish all of those graces and the things of Christ that we've been entrusted with, that he might be glorified in his church today. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.